Hey guys, welcome to our Wednesday night study on the book of James. We're about to wrap it up this evening, although I'm not going to make it all the way to verse 20. I had only <laughs> mapped out verses 13 to 16. And so, but there's plenty there for us to tackle for this evening. Uh, Aaron is here. Uh, Mike Hello. and Vern both had issues that they had to attend this evening. So it's just Aaron and me. Sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, as per our custom, which is a time-honored custom. Um, Long-standing tradition. I have, uh, I have a few jokes, and, and, and I didn't share these with Erin because it's, mo it's basically in the form of a quiz for her, a Bible quiz. All right. I'm okay. Ready. He did not tell me the and, answers. And, and on my, uh, my Bible quizzes are, are usually not very fair. Okay. <laughs> so um, you may know some of these here, Erin. Okay. What time of day was Adam created? These are all about Adam and Eve, by the way. Okay. So what time of day was Adam created? Oh, is that mentioned? Um, it is. In the morning? No, a little before Eve. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hilarious, yeah. hilarious. Late uh, afternoon. Now, this one here, and the only reason I'm going to do this one is because, as you can tell, I am old, considered a dinosaur, okay? And so because of that, I can tell old dinosaur-like jokes. Okay. Okay? So why did God create man before woman? Hmm... He didn't want any advice. <laughs> now that's just inappropriate, isn't it? Hilarious. Enjoy. All right. <laughs> now, did Eve ever have a date with Adam? Hmm. I mean, he was calling her bone of his bone and stuff. Yeah, I never had a date with her, just, uh, just an apple. Just an apple. <laughs> yeah, and then he was like, get her out of here. <laughs> and uh, now this one here, it's, it's really not a question. Uh, just a, it's just a reflection on what took place. Eve says, Adam, are you seeing someone else? Adam says, how? You're the only woman on earth. <laughs> and, and Adam says, well, now what are you doing? Eve says, I'm counting your ribs. <laughs> like, did he give any more up? <laughs> Make any other people? <laughs> so Adam and Eve are sitting under a tree when a fig leaf blows by. And Eve says, oh, look, there goes the invisible man. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny. A little bit. Now, do you're getting you ragged on in the comments, by the way. <laughs> Whitney says these jokes are bad. Connie says that poppycock. <laughs> poppycock. No, these are good. Come on, guys. Um, what nationality were Adam and Eve? Well, they're Eden. Soviet. They're Soviet. No, what else? Who else would walk around barefoot, naked, have one apple to share between them, and think they're in paradise? Now, that was an old joke. <laughs> the Soviet Union. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny. Okay. And one more. Just one more. Okay. If Eve sacrificed the human race for an apple, what do you think she'd do for a Klondike bar? <laughs> That's true. Whitney says, just stop. He's done. Just stop. And he's done. <laughs> it is. I am done. I actually have two more, but I decided they were too bad. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Whitney. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we're going to talk about prayer and confession, and I'm going to raise a number of questions that I don't have an answer for, uh, and, and this, this ought to be something that surprises us or bothers us. Now, I can remember, now you're working on a PhD, and so you probably have had similar experiences, but I'm going to give you a couple and then let you reflect on it. I, okay. I know one time when I was in seminary, I was writing a paper on a very difficult passage in 1 Corinthians 7. And when I started out, I didn't know a whole lot about the passage. And the, the more I dug, the more confused I got. <laughs> and um, I finally went up to the prof, who was a world-renowned scholar in Pauline stuff, especially 1 Corinthians, and uh, told him my struggle. And and Dr. Barchi looked at me and says, well, Steve, I know a whole lot less than I did when I was your age. But uh, <laughs> what I do know, I'd die for. And, uh, but it just expressing this idea that sometimes when you dig, it doesn't always answer your question. Sometimes it raises more. Oh, absolutely. In fact, um, <laughs> in the PhD program, one of the things my, I was convinced that a doctoral work is designed to convince you how little you know absolutely and this how many true. questions you didn't even know to ask mm -hmm. that's your experience as well i bet <laughs> it is <laughs> yes and at some point you just don't get scared of not knowing anymore mm -hmm. okay you have to reach a point where it doesn't bother you in the least right that you don't know all the answers mm -hmm. in fact you start thinking about it if you know all the answers about god then god would be pretty little right yes 
Yes. You know, the whole idea that, that God would fit into our brains and everything that he does makes sense to us um, makes a mighty, mighty, tiny God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it shouldn't surprise us. I mean, there are things that you have to know in order to be a Christian. Um, there are things that you don't have to know and still be a first Christian. And uh, that's one of the things when we talk about the essentials, the non-essentials. Um, I mean, there are things that you just hang on to. These are non-negotiables. And there are a whole lot of things that I don't know. Make my best guess. And ultimately, it doesn't uh, rock my faith one way or the other. Right. Whichever way it went. Do you have anything on that? Or do you want to? No, I absolutely agree that the more <laughs> the more questions and the more research that you do, you, you don't tend to figure things out unless you're just you know, solving math problems, especially when it comes to like social things or studies with of humans and human behavior, the more you think you're picking up on really just the more confusing we become. But it, what you were saying reminded me a bit of reading the book Jurassic Park, but he talks <laughs> about, right. randomly enough, he talks about how, um, how in the point, and if you'll remember in the Crichton? movie, Right, yeah. And if you'll remember in the movie, or if you've read it, maybe, but um, I think it's Ian Malcolm that says, like, you were so worried about if you could, you didn't stop to think if you should. Should. Uh And in the book, that passage really impacts that whole sentiment a lot more, but it makes the point that, like, by the time you can kill a man with your hands, you're too disciplined to do it. And so it just reminded me a bit of that sentiment of, like, it takes a lifetime to master something, or, like, we don't know how to do everything. And so the more you study the more you learn the more calm you kind of become and and resting in that confidence of like i know that i'm not gonna need to know all of these or i'm gonna need to actually use this necessarily this discipline it scares a lot of people you know if they someone asks a question about god or the bible and they say i don't know they they think somehow it ought to rock their faith and goodness gracious no Mm-hmm. But the passage we're going to deal with tonight raises a lot of questions that I don't have a good answer for. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're going to surface some of the questions. We're going to play around some of the possible answers a little bit, but I'm not sure where it's going to go. But if you don't mind, Aaron, sure. I'm going to put the text up on screen. I put it in two different versions, okay, the NIV and then the message. Would you mind just reading through it so we sure. can look at it? Yep, this is the NIV. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will be made, will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So then this is in the message. Are you hurting? Pray. Do you feel great? Sing. Are you sick? Call the church leaders together to pray and anoint you with oil in the name of the master. Believing prayer will heal you, and Jesus will put you on your feet. And if you sinned, you'll be forgiven, healed inside and out. Make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. The prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with. That's the text. Yeah. Interesting text. Perhaps... um, doesn't seem too controversial at the outset, Hmm. but the deeper you dig, the more questions are raised, the more you begin to see the head scratchers. Mm -hmm. Now it starts out like this, and this this doesn't seem too hard. James 5.13, this is pretty simple. If you're in trouble, pray. If you're happy, praise, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we don't do them equally well. I think people (laughs) are prone to pray when they're in trouble. In fact, that's the only time when a lot of people pray is when they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Um, But this, this really isn't, isn't controversial. Right. Okay. Um, Now, a couple of things I want to point out is that if you were looking at this in the Greek, which we're not, right? Uh, But sometimes Greek helps us a little bit. Mm -hmm. When it says, if anyone among you is in trouble, let them pray. Let them pray is the way English tries to handle a third person imperative. Okay. An imperative is a command. Mm. And so how are you gonna command a third person? How, how in English do you mm-hmm. do that? We say, let them pray. That doesn't sound like a command. Right. Um, if I were to translate it, they must pray. That's getting closer to the sense. Mm, okay. Okay. Let them pray. So if you're in trade, pray dudes Mm -hmm. okay yeah that's that's what a christian does is anyone happy praise 
direct it to God. Mm-hmm. This isn't just about you and your happiness. Mm-hmm. Um, he, th- these are orders. Right. Sing songs of praise. And uh, we struggle with third person imperatives in English. Okay. Hmm. But when you see them in Greek, you know that this, this is a strong thing. It's much closer to a must. In trouble, pray. Um, happy, praise. In either direction, make sure that whether it's really good or really, really bad, you're pulling God into the center of it. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that that means that anything in the middle, pull God into the center of it. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the two extremes in the middle too. Yeah. And so it's a, it's just basically saying, make God a part of everything. Mm-hmm. If you're a Jesus follower, God's with you. Mm-hmm. He's in it. The reason that you're happy is because he made you with the capacity for being happy, right? right. Um, if you're sad, he's God, and he can either give you the strength to get through it or he can fix it. Mm-hmm. And either way, make sure that you you knew that you're not doing the, you know that you're not doing this thing alone. Mm-hmm. That you're doing it hand in hand with God because mm-hmm. you're a Jesus follower. And so I, this one here is fairly straightforward. Just something we don't do well. Yeah. What do yeah. you think? Uh, I've got the NLT in my Bible, and it says, "Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises." So. Yeah. Should is another way of doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still you, you just have to recognize should doesn't have to be a command Mm -hmm. you think more command so if it's a should make sure it's capitalized right yeah like all yeah do it stressed (laughs) come on guys you know that's that's what it's doing Mm -hmm. but this is a little verse this is not where the troubles come Mm -hmm. um that's just kind of the setup verse he keeps on going now this is the third thing first of all if you're in trouble pray Mm -hmm. if you if you are happy Happy. praise Mm -hmm. if you're sick pray Mm -hmm. that's the next piece but it's more than just pray in this particular case. Yeah. Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them. Why? Right. Um, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Why? Mm-hmm. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. Are you serious? The Lord will raise them up. Well, eventually. Mm-hmm. Right? And if they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. Mm-hmm. What does that have to do with it? Right. I mean, you got question after the other question mm-hmm. in this particular verse, right? Why would you call the elders when sick? Most of our people think not automatically doctor, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. not elders. Does that mean every time you get a cold, you're supposed to call the elders? Right. And seriously? Um, and why would you call the elders? Why do you think the prayer of the elders would be more significant than the prayer of your family and friends? Mm-hmm. Is it that somehow when you become an elder, your prayer becomes holier and more powerful? Right. Why? And is he suggesting that as a Jesus follower, you ought to be looking to the healing of God, not the healing of medicine? Mm-hmm. Um, is that what this thing is about? And then he tells the elders to anoint him with oil. Why? Um, is it simply because you're trying to put that person, does the oil symbolize putting that person under the care of God? Mm-hmm. Or is oil in that day kind of like their back teen? Right, like they meant a, a actual purpose for yeah, it, like yeah. something. Yeah. You know, when I'm, I'm, I've got a finger that's wounded right now. Mm-hmm. One of the things that the doctor told me to do was put Vaseline on it. Right. Form of oil, okay? Right. Keep it, keep the like thing a moist. practical right. advice, yeah. So is he just tell, basically telling you, treat it with meds and pray? Mm-hmm. Or is he saying that make sure that when you are sick, you, you put yourself under the care of God and that kind of a thing? I don't know. And then he says, oh, the prayer offered in faith will make a sick person well, which means I will bet every single one of us who's a Jesus follower for any length of time have prayed for people mm-hmm. and they have not been healed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've got a comment in the chat just to that point. Of- every time. Mm-hmm. Uh, does that mean that there wasn't sufficient faith? Mm-hmm. Is the lack of healing or a sign that there's a, um, a lack of faith in that? And it says, if they have sin, where does that come in? Does that mean that somehow James is implying right. that there's a connection between sickness and sin? Mm-hmm. Well, you look at this verse and holy cow, it's question after question after question, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, hard questions, messy questions. They really are. Mm-hmm. They're extremely messy questions. Now, I'm going to unpack them just a little tiny bit. And okay. this is this is why I start that out by saying, I'm going to raise a lot of questions that I'm not going to answer. Okay? Sorry about that. Bottom line, it's the way it is. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Now, I have been with elders who've been asked to pray for the sick. 
we've had people who wanted to follow this verse uh, to the letter. And so they have asked to meet with the elders and they've asked for the elders of the church to anoint them with oil, to put some oil on their forehead, which is what our elders have ordinarily done, okay? And ask the elders to pray for them. And uh, I can remember that whenever that happens, of course, I'm going to be speaking uh, for elders, and I can't do that because everyone them has their own thoughts. Mm -hmm. But my sense is there's some uneasiness in the room. Mm -hmm. What are we doing? What are we expecting? Mm -hmm. We want to follow the scripture, but we're really not understanding, you know, is right. this oil medicinal? Um, is this oil just ceremonial, symbolic? Um, is this prayer, does that mean that if we pray well, this person is going to get healed? Um, if they don't, have mm -hmm. we done something wrong? Sure. Those kind of questions are, they, they race around the minds mm -hmm. in that kind of a setting. And I've, I've been in that setting more than once. Mm -hmm. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Yeah. So Anxiety inducing. And I can remember uh, the first really time I grappled with this, I was in seminary and living in Jenkins, Kentucky, which is really out in the woods. It was mm -hmm. a huge church, about 25. And uh, <laughs> one of the ladies in my church had been diagnosed with a very serious cancer. And uh, she uh, was prayed for by uh, an evangelist on TV and told that she was healed. And I buried her a year later from that cancer. Yeah. And that can cause a crisis of faith. Right. I was prayed for. Mm -hmm. I was told I was healed. Um, I did everything the way that God ex told me to do it. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work out that way. And people who knew her close, why? Mm -hmm. I mean, she did everything. Is it, there wasn't enough faith? Uh, she believed. She believed fervently. The, right. the pastor who prayed for her believed fervently. But it creates a faith struggle. And I've seen that repeatedly. You have a, someone in your family that you pray for either to come to Christ or to, to get well. And they don't. And, uh, but you promised God, right. mm -hmm. um, is that kind of a notion. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the scripture and you begin to realize that over and over again in the scripture, their prayers weren't always answered this way either. Mm -hmm. And so you have times in the scripture when an apostle or some other set of Christians prayed for somebody and they experienced a healing. And there are other times when God literally tells them, I'm not going to do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, Paul prays how many times for removal of his uh, thorn right. in the flesh? And God mm -hmm. says, nah, I'm yep. not going to do it. Um, there are, if, if God always healed sickness, the first century Christians would still be here. Mm -hmm. yeah. every, every single healing in the scripture is temporary. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that's something we don't reflect on. You know, sometimes God will step in because God can do that. He's got that kind of a power. But it always bothers me, you know, because then the person for whom he doesn't step in, they say, well, what did I do? Why wasn't my prayer honored mm -hmm. that way? Is there something wrong with my faith? Right. It makes me think of the um, parable of the workers and the ones who get hired in the morning mm -hmm. get paid the same as the people who get paid paid at the end of the day or hired at the end of the day and like what I do for people is not yours to assess like when I intervene and when I don't is not not I for haven't us. I have thought of that parable but uh, uh, as a parallel but it's a great parallel you're exactly right um, sometimes what God does for one mm -hmm. we think he owes to us mm -hmm. we think that no one ought to be graced more than me mm -hmm. right right if you are graced, then God owes me the same. Mm -hmm. Even though the whole notion of grace is that it's grace. Mm -hmm. It's not anything Nobody that's deserved. deserved. Yeah. Even Peter, when when Jesus tells him, like, you know, you'll be led away. And um, he says, what about him? About John? He says, it's not, don't worry about what happens to him. So it's even in here, you know, this is a, it's a fair question. It's, mm -hmm. it's it's hard. It's hard to grapple with. The next verse causes almost as much difficulty. At least it does for me. Mm, okay? okay. Most people don't struggle with this verse as much as I do. I do it because I'm just cantankerous. Um, <laughs> but he says, confess your sins to each other. Confess your sins to each other. 
What the heck's that mean? <laughs> Pray for each other. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Is it praying for each other after confessing your sins to each other? Or are the two linked? Hmm. Is it confess to each other and pray for each other? Is that talking about a single event? Or is he talking about two different things we do for each other? To confess sins for each other, we also pray for each other so that you may be healed. Looks to me like here they are linked. Confess your sins and then pray mm-hmm. for each other. Does it In the Greek, does it say for each other separately like that? Like instead of it saying confess your Keep sins and for pray for second. each other. Keep talking for just a second. As, I will check. Okay. Yeah. Because it seems like there would be a distinction between confess your sins and pray for each other as opposed to confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Well, it kind of sounds to me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. This is cumbersome, but I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to find the verses we're talking in the Greek. Greek Bible um, quiz. I thought you were going to get me with the Bible quiz tonight. You hit me with it. <laughs> um, but I've got to go to the SBL Greek New Testament, and then we're going to go to verse, what is it? This is verse uh, 16. Mm-hmm. Um, confession to one another and pray on behalf of one another. There's two one another's in there. Mm. Uh, it's confess, therefore confess to one another, and it's basically the mm-hmm. word for confess, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to imply sins. Oh, there it is. Uh, confess uh, to one another your sins. Okay. Right? It, it does it in that order, and pray on behalf of one another in order that you another. might be healed. Hmm. Okay, And so the two are, are separated, but again, um, I think what you would ordinarily assume is that when you confess your sins to one another, they would make the assumption if I were to confess a sin against you they would make the assumption that as a Christian you would forgive me right and then we'd pray for each other mm-hmm. okay right. in that in that healing process mm-hmm. others would say confess sins just tell each other that we're all jerks and then make sure you're praying for each other to stay strong mm-hmm. but those are the two different ways that this is done mm-hmm. you know um, and, and as I've mentioned before, this has been a struggle for me since college. I, c- I can remember right. being in a prayer meeting in college. I was at a Bible college, so we had prayer meetings. And uh, the guy who was leading the prayer meeting got up and he read this verse, confess your sins to each other. And he says, I'll start with mine, and then you go. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I got a little squirrely you know maybe I'm the only one with sins I didn't want to confess I don't know but I looked at my roommate and he didn't want to either and yet we didn't want to disobey scripture because here there's two ministerial students we're trying to be preachers and right. I'm not going to just say blow off James if that's what he wants me to do and I finally just raised, raised my hand in a bible study I think you're getting it wrong dude and um, I don't think it says that I'm supposed to sit here and tell you what my sins are. I think it means that if I hurt you, that I ask for your forgiveness, that I confess my sin against you to you. Mm-hmm. And uh, remarkable humility for a young man. Young men aren't humble. <laughs> but he, he, he kind of cocked his head and thought, and he says, huh, maybe you're right. I don't know. And so we didn't. Mm-hmm. We just moved on in the meeting and, and didn't do that kind of a thing. And... I still think I was probably right. Mm-hmm. Not certain, as certain as I was then. <laughs> Not as certain as you were then. <laughs> no. Um, but I think it means at the least, if I sin against somebody, I ought to confess my sin to them. Right. Because that sin's going to put up a wall. Right. Between the two of us. Yeah. And I think that when a brother confesses their sin, that a brother or a sister ought to forgive Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's a command of Jesus Mm -hmm. okay in fact even if they don't confess their sin you ought to begin the process of forgiveness because ultimately holding them accountable is God's job not mine well and if you're in a situation where like you didn't know about something and somebody it was a burden to somebody and then they're saying like I'm going to confess that I did this you didn't know that this happened and I'm telling you I did this then you should then you you know that's you're obligated to forgive that yeah yeah and there are times when I've actually counseled you know my, my guru of forgiveness is a guy named Lewis Smeads he wrote a book called The Art of Forgiving which I think is brilliant but he says most of the time confess your sin 
to another person. Because sometimes my confession of, if I were to, I'm going to confess a sin to you right now. Aaron, I've always hated you because I've always thought you're a jerk. I would just laugh. <laughs> <laughs> now, I might unburden myself, but what have I done to you? Right, right. Okay. That's, yeah. Confessing a sin should not make myself feel good at the expense of crushing somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's not what this is talking about. Mm -hmm. And so there are times confessing a sin as long as what I'm not doing is trying to put a, uh, a shawl of, of shame mm -hmm. on that person. Mm -hmm. And so, by the way, that was, I was teasing. That's oh, not, no, that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, but... Uh, Confession of sin, if you, if you sin against somebody, make it right if right. you can. Mm -hmm. um, if you can, so <clears throat> be it. Make it right with God and try not to do it again. Well, I think you made a good point, though, because it does. It puts up a wall. Like, it, ultimately, it's you're not going to be your best self, and you're not going to have the best relationship with that person because of the guilt and shame. Mm -hmm. And now, and just like you talked about, you know, a couple weeks ago about guilt and shame, that puts up walls between us and God. And mm -hmm. so it's just one thing leads to another. Like, don't don't be messy. Just tell people what's going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So question after question after question. We got this verse, you know, it starts out pretty easy. If you're suffering, pray. If you're happy, praise. If you're sick, call the elders. And then all that slew of questions that comes with that. And then you've got this verse, confess your sins to each other so that you may be healed. And it does a bunch of head scratching because I don't know. And so. What I want to do for a little bit here, which is kind of strange, is instead of trying to answer these questions, I want to look at some big ideas that I don't care what your question, how you answer your, these individual questions, these principles just lay through the passage. Okay. okay. These are some big ideas that you can't miss. Number one, no Christian is alone. Hmm. Yeah. If, if you're suffering, pray. Mm -hmm. God's there. If you're happy, pray. God is there. If you have sins, you got a church family, dude. Mm -hmm. um, and remove all the walls from that church family. You're not alone. Yeah. And you are uh, undoubtedly, you've, you've probably don't mind this way more than I have, but loneliness is one of the worst, most crushing of human emotions. People are flat out lonely and it's killing people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was exacerbated during this whole COVID thing yeah, right. when the isolation was just making it terrible mm -hmm. um, on people who couldn't get out and interact uh, yeah. what it was doing to them emotionally uh, what it was doing to them socially I mean, you look at the uh, the incidence of uh, uh, drinking mm -hmm. um, incidence of violence right yeah. um, depression um, suicidal thoughts mm -hmm. all of those things loneliness is just absolutely terrible yeah. yeah and the one thing is is that God did not make us to go it alone None of us ought to have the sense that we're alone in this thing. Yeah, I read a book um, a while ago, and it was about a young woman, and she, it was about her life and how she worked in this office. But anyway, the author was prompted to write this after reading a statistic about how many, um, I don't know, it was some crazy number of people in New York City who don't speak to another human being when they leave the office Friday afternoon until Monday morning. Really? And so they just live in total silence for the entire time that they are not in the office and just what that is doing to people. And so it's, it's I can't remember the full title. It's something Eleanor, Eleanor Oliphant, but um, a really interesting, quirky character that's on the outs of the community within her office. But yeah, it was really, really troubling to think about how many people do not speak to another soul. And one of the things that we're finding, and you, there may be disagreement, I know there's disagreement on this one, is that the connection that people have digitally mm -hmm. is not replacing That's the connection right. that people have physically. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, but it scratches that itch. And so that instant gratification of connection is met and we're forgetful creatures and then we just buzz on and about but yeah you're right it does not fully meet the need for yeah, connection it it's one of the reasons that uh, I think God designed the church it's mm -hmm. not only just to be his uh, presence in the world as a light to the nations but um, this is where we help each other live a great life mm -hmm. we drag each other to heaven 
Yeah. Um, because we're not made to go it alone. It's just, I mean, that's not just a phrase that I use. It's a conviction that I have. No, I, I, it's true. I mean, we don't have family right in Frankfurt. And so when we're at church, I mean, it's rare for us, for my husband and I to feel like we can relax a little bit when our our little guys around because we have you know we're just like vigilant parenthood because you're out mm-hmm. at a park or you're at a restaurant or you're somewhere and it's us two and him but man when you're a church family and like he's with the other kids and like the pool party of us being Isn't there cool? together it's like the feeling of knowing that you are just in that family reunion environment where like you know the other kids he's playing with you know that everybody there loves them and and you different. belong mm-hmm. um, um, and, and the people around you care about you. And yeah. uh, that sense of being part of a group um, that has each other's backs. Yeah. And it's not just an assumption like, oh, well, I'm at a church function, so he's fine. It's because I truly do like know and feel loved by my family here. It's one of the reasons that we actually have started scheduling these uh, summer block parties. Right. Mm-hmm. The, uh, there are so many people that are doing life in isolation and they need to know that they're a part of something. You walk into that place and it goes back to that old cheers. Everybody knows mm-hmm. your name and everybody cares that you're there. That's right. Yeah. It's a we big t- deal. We talk about that a lot. Like on our Wednesday, I'm going to do a shameless mom life plug. But that's a big deal with, you know, we, we talk about that, especially like younger women, like your tribe. And we've lost that as a community. Yes. We mm-hmm. Women would have literally been together doing life together and, and raising our children. And we don't. That's not a part of our society anymore. So to have that, a community, to have a tribe, the help, it is, it's huge. It's life-changing. In fact, uh, they did a study. This is a little bit older study, but I don't think anything would have changed. But they found that the number one reason that a boatload of people, maybe the majority of people go to church is friendship. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a place where Mm -hmm. they belong. Mm -hmm. And it's just incredibly important to them. And so that's just something, uh, you know, big idea number one, no Christian is alone. First of all, you can see in the text, God is always there. If you're in trouble, pray. Mm -hmm. God's there. He's here, right? If you're happy, praise. God is there. He's with you. He's enjoying this with you, Mm -hmm. okay? If you're sick, pray. You know, even though you're calling in the church, you're still praying to God. If you're fighting sin, pray, okay? And the whole notion is, is that no matter what you're going through, the whole gamut from the worst to the best... We tend to ignore him and forget him, but he's there. Mm -hmm. We're living in the presence of God, but not just in the presence of God. We have this understanding that as Jesus followers, we're doing life with God. He's in us. Mm -hmm. And every tear we shed, he shares. Every laugh that we laugh, he enjoys. Mm -hmm. Um, God loves doing life with his people. And that's an odd concept Mm -hmm. for a lot of folks, that the Almighty God would care about what you feel. Mm -hmm. But that's the way that God is pictured in the scripture. Yeah, yeah. He's pictured as a passionate God who's passionate for you, uh, who adores you, um, who has blessed you, loves to see you smile, hates to see you cry, um, but he wants to do life with us. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah. and that's big, I think. Well, and I think that's why we get to have, and you know, you talk about the fingerprints of God and to have that agape love to have that love of like choosing love and and having those relationships and we know what that feels like and then but then to feel like the parental love or Mm -hmm. and you know any type of love i think that those relationships are dependent on communication they're dependent on if if we just go through our day and don't share anything with anybody but the first thing I want to hear from my kiddo is how his day was or you know when we lay down at night I want to hear what his favorite part of the day was even if I was with him all day like you he, still want to hear it from him that's right yeah you want that communication you want to talk to them and the whole idea that God wants that from us makes no sense to us but he does <laughs> yeah and uh, and knowing that is supposed to be a solace to us it's supposed to be a strengthening thing for us mm-hmm. but it's not only the fact that God is there no Christians alone because God made his family. Mm-hmm. We are literally family. Wellington Boone, uh, I think it was at a Promise Keepers convention years and years ago, but I never forgot it. He says, if God is your father, you must be my brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. God's your dad, you must be my sister. How mm-hmm. cool is that? I didn't know we were related. Yep. We're family. And um, 
But it is a powerfully good idea. Mm -hmm. um, ben Webb, when he I was just this. thinking that. Well, what ben, go on, no, then. I was going to say that it's what made me think is what Ben shared this Sunday was in his introduction was that we've been eating the Lord's Supper together for 39 years because he's he's our brother and he has always been part of our family and we're just sharing space now. I really appreciated that thought. Yeah, so he's he's finally put his knees under the same table mm -hmm. physically that we are, but he's been part of our family mm -hmm. for a long, long time. Yeah. And there's automatically a connection mm -hmm. because he's a Jesus follower. Yeah. And we're family. How cool is that? Yeah, and the, the, that's global. Like, the, the whole mm -hmm. world. And yeah, through space and time, how big our family is. But you can see it in this text. God made his family. If you're sick, don't just go to God. Go to the church. Mm -hmm. You got brothers and sisters who care. Mm -hmm. If you're struggling with sin, go to the church. You have brothers and sisters who care. You're not in this thing alone. You don't have to pull this weight alone now. However you understand the prayers of the church for mm -hmm. your sickness, however you understand the confession of sin, the fact is you're part of a family. You're yeah. not in this thing alone, mm -hmm. okay? And this, this first idea, no matter how you answer the question, is that um, God didn't make you to go alone, and he made sure he put you in a physical family, he put you in a spiritual family, and he expo expects both of those things to be healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's big idea number one. I, that's, uh, no, you got I anything think. else on that one? No, I think that's big. Yeah, huge. Big idea number two. God wants both sides of your heart. He wants the happy stuff, and he wants the bad stuff, and he mm -hmm. wants everything in between, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. God wants every corner of your heart. There isn't a part of your life that doesn't that you don't place at Jesus feet he talks specifically if you have trouble go to God mm -hmm. if you're happy remember God if you're sick look at God mm -hmm. I mean if you're sinning remember you know you're no no sin is worth God's disapproval yeah. take it to God get straight with God yeah okay but you look at this thing and it's over and over and over again no matter what the situation is don't shy away from doing it with God mm -hmm. yeah, and I think that's huge mm -hmm. no yeah I think that that makes a lot of sense and the flow of those first few verses I, I think sometimes that I read something one time it was a meme, meme that said that Paul would be rolling in his grave if he knew he turned his letters into Torah <laughs> I bet you so <laughs> and so I think maybe James was just trying to make a point here like all the things go to God and not like the individual little pieces. But I think that, yeah, what you're saying here. Is... Yeah, I think the very fact that he starts, that he goes the whole spectrum, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. trouble, happiness, stuff that is in between. Yeah. I think he's just trying to say, guys, all the things. Remember, do life with God. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're supposed to be. And the whole notion of it, when it says God wants every corner of your heart, um, take your trouble to God, take your happiness to God, take your sickness, take your sin to God. Taking it to God only works if you remember in prayer who's boss. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I know that sounds a little bit strange, but a lot of people think of prayer as my way to get God to do what I want. Mm -hmm. Right. When it's talking about the prayer of faith, mm. does that mean that I'm going to try to believe hard enough that I can get God to do my will? Right. That I can bend him to my agenda and if i behave in a certain way then he will match pace exactly. with me because he owes me that because i did this yeah i pray the right words um i pray with the right amount of faith i put the right coins into the cosmic vending machine and so mm -hmm. i get what i want out of god mm -hmm. that's not what a prayer of faith is mm -hmm. a prayer of faith is bending my will to god's will okay yeah what we tend to want to do is I want success. I want some kind of a, a gift from God. And I ask God to help me to endorse my goal, to accept what I want. Okay. I want God to be my cheering section. Mm -hmm. If I need money, I want God to increase my income. God's going to provide the bonus. A bonus. If, I, mm -hmm. if someone has hurt my feelings, I want God's vindication. Mm -hmm. I want him to protect me. Okay. If I'm sick, I want God to give me a cure. And the problem is, is that typically prayer tends to be using God more than seeking God. Mm. Getting God to do our bidding more than bending our knees to his bidding. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about prayer, the way James talks about prayer, it's a very, very humble, a very surrendered, a very submissive thing. I am taking myself and putting it under God. And... Uh, 
I, I think you have to have that sense here. When, it's, when you're taking it to God, that isn't trying to enlist God as mm-hmm. your ally. Mm-hmm. It's bending yourself to God. Mm. Yeah. You got anything more on that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. It's hard for us, I think, to that will he gave us. <laughs> we want to use it. and We want it to, to matter. <laughs> you got it. And then the next verse, I'm, I didn't, I'm not going to go straight to big idea number three because I just wanted to stop off here just in, as it relates to this particular question. It says, the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up, and if they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. Okay? Remember, the prayer of faith is not about believing hard enough so that God will do what I want him to do. The prayer of faith... And I don't know what that means, you know. I can spiritualize this if I want and say that God always heals because most of his healing is spiritual, not physical. I can say that, Mm -hmm. all right? I feel bad saying that. I'm not sure that's what he means. Mm -hmm. But it's it makes sense. But the the main thing here is when you're looking at something like this, just remember prayers were offered by men of faith throughout the scripture that were not answered. You go to Hebrews 11 and you find all these guys who are fierce Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they died for their faith. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of them died sickness, some of them died of persecution. Mm -hmm. Um, Prayer does not guarantee that God's going to make your life easier. Mm -hmm. Um, God God will heal. Um, Not always our way, not always our time, but he will heal. That's a guarantee. That's something we expect. In fact, when I look at the healings of Jesus, you know, one of the things that I try to teach when I'm going through the miracles of Jesus is that more than just a demonstration that he has divine power, the miracles of Jesus are a glimpse at what's coming. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily a statement that this is how this age is going to be um, remade. Mm -hmm. It's talking about what's coming. When God calmed the storm, he points forward to a time when storms will no no longer cause the chaos. Mm -hmm. They will be brought under the thumb of God. Mm -hmm. Um, When God heals the blind and the lame, um, there'll be a time. Time is coming because this is who God is and this is is God's dream that this stuff will no longer cripple his children. Uh, There will no longer be death because God has power over death. He's giving us a glimpse of what's coming more so than a promise of the kind of changes he will make for all of us in this age. Mm -hmm. And so you got to keep that kind of stuff in mind. Uh, When people left, when Jesus left, there were still people who were sick. Um, People who were healed by Jesus died of something else. Um, All of the miracles were temporary, but they were pointing to a time when this kingdom of the world is going to be fixed by God and so I don't know if that helps at all but those are just some of my own musings Mm -hmm. Um, basically with a text that I struggle with I I really don't know how to uh, to go beyond that with with respect to these words no well I appreciate that you know is a to share that that's very honest to share so I think that alleviates the rest of us a little bit yeah it's it's hard these are these are hard verses for me yeah and then the, here's the third big idea, that confessed sin will be forgiven. Okay, now listen. When, you, when I say confessed sin will be forgiven, that is a promise and a command. Hmm. It's a promise from God and it's a command of God. <clears throat> it's a promise that if you confess your sin, it will be forgiven. Mm-hmm. In fact, John puts that as clear as can be. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just. He'll forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Mm-hmm. You know, the fact it's a promise from God. Yeah. Um, if you confess your sin, that wall between you and God is knocked down. Mm-hmm. God will not hold that sin against you. Okay, mm-hmm. confession removes that barrier. Um, now He forgives you even for sins that you haven't confessed. But, mm-hmm. You know the fact is, as long as you're in Christ, you don't have to remember every sin that you've ever committed for God to have forgiven it. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact is, that you stand in Christ and you stand forgiven Mm -hmm. with respect to God but this is a promise you know you confess your sins you you acknowledge before God you're a sinner that you need his grace he's lavish with it Mm -hmm. that's one piece okay anybody who repents from the heart is forgiven by God you have to own that thing now the other piece of it though which is just as important is that it's a command if 
I confess a sin to you. Um, you have an obligation. This is this going to sound terrible. <laughs> you have an obligation before God to forgive. Yeah. I don't think it sounds terrible. I, I, I know some people say, well, and, and part of the problem is, is that I don't want God to be as gracious with those who have hurt me as he is with me. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe I'm speaking too fast. I said, I don't think that sounds unfair, but I don't know. I'm getting a little more creative in my mind of things that could be confessed to me and that I might not can, I mean, I can forgive as grudge. easily. I don't, I'm not fond of God's grace with people that I think deserve a little bit more pain. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, been twice in my life, I've, I've told people before, twice in my life that I've hated, which means that I reached a point where I didn't care if that person went to hell. Mm. That's about as ungodly as you can get. That's the opposite mm-hmm. of Christ. Right. Okay. Um, but it's easy for us to get there. Mm-hmm. We do not want to forgive and we don't want God to forgive them. We don't want God to go easy on them. Yeah. Forgiving somebody is maybe the hardest thing God asks us to do. Mm-hmm. If someone who hurts you or yours, the last thing you want to do is forgive them. Right. And so, but basically, what he's saying is, if a person confesses their sin, you need to you need to let it go. Mm-hmm. You need to let God deal with it. This yeah. is not yours to deal with any longer. Um, and Jesus puts this strong: if you don't forgive, your sins won't be forgiven. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the word, the way Jesus puts it, is terrifying. Yeah. Okay. Um, Someone confesses a sin, you make it right. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, quit holding it against them. I've, I've seen marriages mm-hmm. where they refuse to forgive. Yeah, um, someone has committed an egregious sin, and the partner will not forgive them. Yeah. Now, forgiveness does not mean that you have to reconcile, but you have to forgive. Mm-hmm. You cannot. You cannot take it upon yourself to continue to punish a person for sins that God has tried to deal with and you're supposed to deal with. Because ultimately it's you and there's um, something, I can't remember the, how it goes, but something about holding a grudge is like holding the coals, a hot coals with the intent to throw them at somebody else or something that you just yep. end up burning yourself. Like. Which is why Smead says that when you forgive somebody, you set a prisoner free. That's right. Which, which you hate, but then you discover that the prisoner's you. Because mm-hmm. if you don't forgive, you're basically causing your own, own soul. You're putting a cancer in your own soul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, forgiveness is a community thing. It's not just a God thing. It's a, it's a Christian community thing. Richard Foster, great, great writer. He said, confession is often difficult because oftentimes we see the church as a community of saints. <laughs> we think they're a bunch of saints <laughs> right. rather than as a community of sinners. Yeah. I mean, everybody, I make the assumption that all of, everybody around is just as much a jerk as I am, <laughs> and um, which may be mean-spirited, but you know, one, one, one guy told me one time that all scholarship's autobiographical. We automatically project ourselves into what we read, and I do. <laughs> and I, I know I'm a bit of a jerk, so I assume everyone else is too. Um, but we come to believe that everyone else has advanced so far into holiness that we're isolated and alone in our sin. Yeah. We're not. Yeah. We all struggle, dudes. Mm-hmm. Every single one of us struggles. That's right, yeah. We can't bear to reveal all our failures and shortcomings to others. We think we're the only ones who've not stepped onto the high road of mm-hmm. heaven. So we hide and we live in veiled lies and hypocrisy. Yep. And I think he's right. We're terrified to confess because we don't realize that we're just another... <laughs> they're just like we are everybody yeah and we're it, all beggars begging grace it is the greatest lie that we all just consume so readily and i found it even in like <laughs> i was actually just thinking about this the other day even in like weird like some medical thing happens or like like the doctor tells you like oh this we're gonna have to do this procedure and like man those things just they do me anyway. They make me very anxious. But I have found any time that I have like opened up to somebody and been like, this is going on with me. Like I just found out that this thing happened. Like the, the response is always, oh, the same thing happened to me. <laughs> it's yeah, never, yeah, yeah. it's never a big deal. It's always like the things that burden us so much. And that's not to say that we don't have things that are truly bi- a big deal. But it's, I think that we get ourselves convinced and, and terrified uh-huh. of 
realities that just aren't there. You know, the series we just wrapped up, Bloodstained Pews, the whole principle of the thing is that if you want people to come here and find healing, then they better f see you finding healing. Mm -hmm. um, if you want them to come in and bleed so they can be tended, then you better be open about the fact that you bleed too mm -hmm. and are finding healing in this place. If we're not transparent about our own struggles and about right. some of the strength that we're finding in Christ, then how do we expect to be the light to the nations? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and this is this is a huge deal. There has to be a level of transparency. And so yeah. one of the things that I've learned as a preacher over time is that I try to be somewhat transparent. Mm -hmm. I struggle. Okay, I'm not going to tell you how. I'm not going to let you all be voyeurs, but um, I struggle, just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I yeah, know that uh, there are a few. Most people who get to know me don't recognize me as a holy man anymore, which is uh, <laughs> which is just fine because I'm not. But it's uh, we have to be transparent enough to recognize. Hey, man, I'm, I've struggled too. I mean, I just mentioned I've hated twice. Mm -hmm. I'll admit there are two times when I. Um, I had such anger in me that I didn't, I, I don't think I would have cared if, if God had damned them to hell. Mm. And, uh, and I do know that that is the opposite of uh, a God honoring heart. Yeah. And so, but I struggle with forgiveness. It's one of the toughest things for me to do. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been a battle for a lifetime and I hope I'm better now than I used to be. <laughs> so basically the three big ideas, no Christians alone. He wants every corner of your heart and confess sin will be forgiven by God for sure, mm -hmm. by us better, okay? Because mm -hmm. that's the way he wants it to be. So, um, do you have anything else before I wrap up to our closing stuff? No, I don't think so. I was just looking back through the comments. Um, <clears throat> looks like there was some discussion on whether to pray for oneself and then there were some responses of other other folks saying that they do. They play for, pray for themselves and ask for forgiveness and thank him for being with us and um, ask God to help me understand what his will is. And um, So I think we talked about that some too, of just mm -hmm. like doing life with God and being in that relationship. And um, we've got it. Uh, somebody said you don't like the hug. So I think that was To tell you the truth, I'm list. not as bad as I used to be. It's warming um, up to the idea. Out in the West, when I, I came from Oregon, I didn't grow up as a hugger, and the people around me didn't hug. If you hugged me, I'd probably smack you. But the uh, when I got out here, all these people are hugging. I got it. Got it. Stay away. Yeah. And then I began to, as I grew a little bit older, I began to realize um, there's power in good, honorable touch. Mm. Um, we're brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes a um, good handshake, mm -hmm. good hug, is healing. Yeah. And uh, and so the resistance that I came to be known for is no longer there. I don't mind people thinking I still hate it, <laughs> but I don't. Don't tell anybody, y'all. Don't tell but anyone. Okay. As Kentuckians I have rubbed off. And I have softened. Now, there's a lot of things <laughs> about being in the South that I enjoy thoroughly. And that's one of those things. I think it's a good, good, healthy thing. I do have a, a question if you want to impact. Mm -hmm. So it says, is it okay to wipe the dust of your feet from someone who refuses to address their guilt against you once you have forgiven them despite their not acknowledging the wrong against me? It, like I said, forgiveness does not require reconciliation. Okay? Forgiveness, in order to forgive, you have to acknowledge that what someone did was wrong. You don't forgive by denying that what they did was wrong. That's not forgiveness. That's denial. Okay? Um, to forgive something, you have to say, that hurt. Mm -hmm. That was wrong. That's not God honoring what happened. Okay? Um, forgiveness is a, a process of saying that um, I don't mind anymore if God heals them. I don't mind anymore mm -hmm. if God blesses them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It does not require that I reconcile. Um, you know, there are times let's say an adultery in a relationship um, where the uh, relationship does not have to be restored under God I think he likes it when it is and it's and it goes back together again in a healthier fashion than it was before I think that's very God honoring but it's not required by God mm -hmm. um, reconciliation is not necessary forgiveness is forgiveness is basically saying okay I'm gonna leave this to God mm -hmm. it's not on me to punish them any longer mm -hmm. It's uh, 
I'm going to trust that God will do the right thing, um, which may not be the thing that I would want him to do, but I've got to trust that God is bigger than me and God is Godder than me. <laughs> um, I'm going to let God be God yeah. and I'm going to stop playing God. Yeah. And uh, so I, th- I think that answers the question. Um, uh, because when you when you notion uh, the notion that you don't have to reconcile, you don't mm-hmm. have to put things back together the way they were um, to forgive. Mm-hmm. Now, does that answer? Yeah, close I enough? think so because it was. I think that that's what they are speaking to. Yeah, they said thank you for your guidance. Okay, well, I hope it's that's Smead's guidance, not mine. I just trust him. <laughs> and so basically, I have my final slide, and the final light, final slide is closing stuff. Okay, which is supposed to be our reminder of us telling them what's coming and then I didn't put anything under I was going to say stuff. there's no notes isn't that isn't that something because usually what happens is I put this slide up here and then I've got notes of what we're supposed to tell you I just read them coming. like I know what's going on yeah I yeah don't. And so we have stuff going on Friday night there is a um, family block party oh that's right I that's do know that this Friday. I'm going to pull up my email from Alethea because she sends us notes well, that is so cool. Why don't you tell us what's coming when you when you get that? And I'll just kind of talk here for a second until you find that email. Keep us going. All right. All right. Here we go. August 12th. Um, that's this Friday. We will have our family block party from 6 to 8, and that is in the party shed. Um, and then... Those are fun, by the way. You the, can get dogs and... and uh, the, I mean, the food's provided. Their game's provided. It's not it just, pet dogs. Hot it just, dogs. It just, There's going to be hot dogs. We're not giving away dogs. Well, I don't mind eating dogs either way. <laughs> Um, go ahead. <laughs> Just basically. Um, and then this Sunday is uh, back to school Sunday, and we are going to be taking uh, donations, school supply donations. Yeah, uh, basically bring in whatever school supplies you think that kids ought to have when they go to school. And one of the things that we're going to put a little twist on it this week, and, and this is just kind of, kind of a, one of my own little biases. Um, we take care of family too. It's not just a matter of taking care of kids in the schools. We're going to try to make sure that if we have families in the church that need supplies for their kids, we'll got we've got your back. Yeah. Come talk to us. You get in the you get into that stuff first. We take care of family, and so um, and whatever's left over, we give to the schools. Um, we'll yeah. have plenty for both. Sounds perfect. But we just want to make sure um, that. Uh, that that if you've got kids and you're struggling at all and you don't have to have Absolutely. to admit anything, just give us a holler and we'll just make sure you got a shot. Sure thing. Please make sure that you contact the church either on Facebook Messenger or call or send we're an gonna, email. We're going to have the supplies here, right? Yeah. And you need some of that stuff. And, you know, I know it's embarrassing sometimes to admit that times are tough, but if times are tough, come and grab it. Come you know, that's what, that's what family does. Family takes care of family. Absolutely. And if you are sending in um, school supply donations, Lisa said no cheap pencils, though. So both ends of the spectrum. Ticonderogas I, I only. Her. Ticonderoga is that, only. Is that what she means? Ticonderoga. That is the pencil brand. It's the only ones that we will like. That Sorry. seems to be we'll really, be pencil really snobs. elitist. It is. It's a pencil snobbery, but she's not wrong. I'll support that. All right. But if you need school supplies, we've got you Because I asked her, and, and she said, well, it, it's obvious. And no, it's not. If you're not a teacher, I don't have a clue what that means. Ticonderoga All is right. the only brand you need. But then there's also going to be a um, back-to-school bash for the students on August 14th at 530, also in the party shed. That's coming up uh, Sunday evening. Yeah. So, um got and then there's a life group host meeting on the 13th i don't uh, know we won't worry about that not we'll everybody needs to know that. about that and then uh next wednesday this is our last oh, facebook that's right. live that's right we're signing uh, off starting next week uh, we'll be back in person now we will continue to broadcast but that'll be the class oh, that yeah, i teach true. in the uh in the student center which is going to be an introduction to the new testament uh, we're going to spend about eight weeks just talking um, why we think this book's important for us. Where did it come from? Why was it written? Uh, why does it have, still have value? I mean, it was written by these peasants 2,000 years ago. Uh, why do we care? Mm-hmm. Um, and then what's in it? And, and, and why do we treat it the way that we do? And so we're going to spend about eight weeks talking about um, 
I, I thought about calling it uh, New Testament for Dummies, but I'm not sure that's politically correct anymore. That used to be common, you know, um, all kinds of books Do for it. dummies. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just, well, maybe I'll just call it New Testament 101, just like it's a, an intro, like yeah. a Bible class. And I go. think that's what I ended up with. But you can call it whatever you want. But it's just going to be an introduction to the New Testament. Oh, but we're going to have a whole spate of other classes. Aaron's going to be teaching one uh, for moms and unmoms, just ladies. Anybody's welcome. We'll take you in. But yeah, yeah mom life, come join our tribe. We're going to be doing the free of me series. And, uh, so we'll, we'll have a whole spate of things. Yeah. We're going to have, okay. I think, uh, also some support groups, uh, uh, divorce care and, and uh, grief share and financial peace and then a whole spate of classes. So that'll start next week and hope to see you. So, And if you're still connecting online, we'll be here uh, just in a little different format. So guys, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you again. Bye.